All right, so virtual network over trail. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, what it is, why it needs to exist, and how it works. Uh, but first, a little background. Uh, I work for Gandhi, as you know, and we are, um, we are, we've been a cloud service provider since before it was actually called cloud. Uh, so we decided we wanted to do an innovative hosting solution that allowed us to generate VM instances from an API very quickly, and we knew we needed a lot of nodes, physical hypervisor nodes to do that, a lot of VM nodes on it, on those, I mean, a lot of VMs on those nodes, I should say. And before we knew it, it grew into what is now known as a public cloud. So it's got lots of features that we added, like the ability to snapshot disks, move VMs around, make the VMs bigger or smaller dynamically. Uh, but in order to add those features, and this is important for what I'm gonna tell you in a minute, we had to make the nodes themselves semi-autonomous. So we had to push automation and distribute the workload of managing these VMs down to those nodes, uh, even when the nodes fail. Um, and so we have near complete automation in our infrastructure now. But we didn't implement customer VLANs. Uh, maybe uh, I should tell you why customer VLANs are important to us. Uh, see, from our perspective, we have this big layer two network with all of our customers' VMs scattered throughout it. Um, and that's great, they can use those on public addresses. Uh, but what a lot of our customers actually want to see is the ability to use their VMs as if they were on their own layer two switch, right? You need isolation for certain applications uh, in order to do the kind of uh, application deployments that uh, you need without having to rely on authentication. Um, if you put it up in a public cloud, you have to really secure it but if you have the option of making that private segment, you can deploy something like memcached, which isn't really designed to support authentication. I think you can put SASL on memcached, but, uh, but it's really designed to be deployed like this. So private VLANs will get you this kind of deployment in the cloud. Um, <laughs> and customers just really think they should work. So this is what we call the challenge of large-scale multi-tenancy. So the multi-tenancy with all of these different customer VLANs in the, in the cloud, private VLANs in the cloud, uh, and the challenge of delivering that kind of multi-tenancy is actually hidden mostly at layer two of the network. I'll just explain what we see as those challenges here. So we want to preserve the advantages that we currently have. Right? We want to preserve the ability to move VMs around from node to node. We want to preserve that lack of management complexity that we got when we got near complete automation. So we can't give up those advantages when we solve this problem. But we also need to solve a couple of other problems which I think are more common to other cloud service providers like layer two scalability. When you add, say, 10,000 systems to a large layer two network, you add 10,000 VM MAC addresses, right? Uh, the top of rack switch table starts to really get full and you start to flood packets. It's a, it's a bad thing. It has to be avoided uh, at scale. And you, you also have to think about the effect of broadcasts in that situation. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the other thing that many people don't realize about uh, a flat <laughs> layer two network is that the spanning tree protocol actually only has one path between VMs on the, uh, in the infrastructure. So you, if you do lose a switch, you have to wait for that to recalculate before you get another path. And that reduces fault tolerance. So we want to enhance the fault tolerance of our solution. And probably the most important thing is that uh, VLANs themselves, you know, you could ask, well, if VLANs are so important, why didn't you just implement them? <laughs> well, does anybody know how many VLANs you can put on a layer two network? 4,096, 4, right. Uh, so you can immediately see the number of customers we could support with one VLAN each. <laughs> and we're way past that now, so we can't do that. Um, 
So this is the challenge, and we have to really meet all of these challenges at once. So how do we do it? Uh, this is a talk about VNT, and that is the solution that we use. The VNT is a combination of something called Trill and something called a Virtual Network Identifier, or VNI. Um, I'll explain those in a second, but we implement Trill on the nodes. So on those hypervisor nodes is where we put the Trill component, and we tag the VM interfaces with that VNI, that Virtual Network Identifier. And I'll explain how that works. You might be asking, you know, what is Trill? It stands for Transparent Interconnection with Lots of Links. And you had another bloody acronym. <laughs> but it is an RFC. Uh, actually, it's been out there for a while. It's a layer two routing protocol. And uh, it combines layer two and layer three features into a new type of network device called an R bridge. And actually, you can buy R bridges from uh, Cisco and others. So there may be people out there using Trill right now. No? OK. Um, <laughs> didn't think so. Uh, and what is VNI? I told you VNT was a combination of Trill and VNI. Think of it like a VLAN tag, only squared. So it's no longer 4096 VLANs. It's 16 million VLANs that you can actually delegate to your customers. So uh, this is why we, uh, we implemented it in this particular way. And the thing to remember about a, a VLAN tag or a, a VNI tag, they work the same way. Uh, you can't get traffic on an interface that's been tagged unless it comes from another interface with the same tag. <laughs> so, uh, no presentation on the structure of virtual networking would be complete without a frame diagram. Here it is. Um, those of you who are familiar with frame diagrams uh, will recognize the green part. It's the kind of Ethernet frame that's actually currently floating around your data center right now. Um, the, uh, the blue part, however, is a trill header. And the effect of this is interesting because in the green part, you have the MAC addresses for all those VMs. Those are you know, what's flooding the top of rack switches. But in the blue part, when you encapsulate that frame, you actually get just the MAC addresses of the nodes, an order of magnitude less. So what happens to the top of rack switch table? It suddenly isn't stressed out anymore. It's still got a lot of traffic, but it's not flooding all of the segments with all the packets anymore when it runs out of space in the table. And what we added to the trill was actually an RFC compliant critical option. And uh, this is important to do this in a compliant way to ensure backwards compatibility with other trill devices. But what we did with that option was add the tag for the VNI. So now we have a way to propagate these, um, these tags throughout the infrastructure. So when we do this, actually, um, I can make the claim that we did it. <laughs> we took care of the top of rack switch overload problem. We took care of um, the VLAN scalability problem. Uh, we took care of, you'll see, fault tolerance because the paths between the nodes are now uh, are now equal cost multipath. Uh, that's a, a, an aspect of Trill. And uh, we preserve, and this is really important, we preserve the simplicity of our management over overhead. Actually, this is one of the things that when we looked at a solution for this, uh, things like software defined networking came up and it was just another whole system to learn. We didn't want to have to do that. So a little bit about how it works. And, so I promised you a technical talk, and here it is. Um, for a given uh, topology, like this one, where we have eight nodes, in Trill, you build a forwarding table for every single node. And you also build one, or if you want more, multicast trees. So I'm going to build the forwarding table and the multicast tree based on node one. And you can see that as, uh, as we build this table, we're actually mirroring the same paths through as the multicast tree does. So if I want to get from node one to node six, I go through node five. And there it is, MAC five uh, is the forwarding for to get, to get from node one to node six. And in fact, 
every single node will build this forwarding table using the link state PDU protocol, LSP, and some other tricks. Um, so once you do that, and everything in every R bridge in the topology has its forwarding table built, it's what we call converged. Okay, so convergence means that all the R bridges have their forwarding tables built, and you're ready to go. Um, so are we done building a topology yet? Well, kind of. I mean, we can get to every other, from every node to every other node. Oh, one other thing I'll, I'll just point out. This is actually shortest path burst, as it should be obvious from the graph, but if you want to get, say, from node two to node six, you have two paths, and they are equal cost. So you actually take care of the fault tolerance, the redundancy of paths by just making enough connections and building equal cost multipaths. So those paths will both be in node two's forwarding table. So if we're done with Trill, are we done with VNT? Not really, because you re remember, we added something to Trill to make VNT. We added the virtual network identifier, and we have to propagate that. All the nodes have to know about that identifier or they won't be able to filter the traffic. So I could probably spend 20 minutes explaining this diagram, but uh, I, will, I will leave that to those of you with um, viewing the video and blowing it up. It uh, it's actually also uses LSP uh, to propagate the VNI throughout the whole infrastructure. And the way it works is each node um, actually gets the, the VNI when you add it to the VM. So uh, it's converged when all of the uh, nodes know about the VNI. I'm, I'm running short of time, so I'm gonna go a little quickly here, but uh, if you use Trill, you can build a, uh, a connection between two VMs by flooding the whole network with ARP, every VM seeing the ARP broadcast, and you will very quickly build a connection. But if you use VNT, uh, remember when you add a VNI, the whole network learns about it, and when you add the second VNI, the whole network already knows the path so that when you ARP, you actually only ARP to the VMs that have that tag on the nodes that have it. And then you get a connection. So VNT uh, cuts way down on ARP. Um, now, these are great claims of supernatural power, and, uh, and you know, we, could, we, we actually have this deployed in our infrastructure uh, right now, and it's working great. But I think I should probably prove it with some experimental slides. So this is one experiment we did by taking, just basically turning off MAC filtering for, the, for a standard layer two network and flooding all the MAC addresses everywhere to all of the switches, all of the nodes, and all of the VMs. And as you might think, with standard layer two, you see the same number of MAC addresses on the left-hand side on all three of those components. So if you just use Trill, just Trill, you pretty much knock out the top of rack switch overload problem, right? I mean, it's a very low number of MAC addresses at the switch. But if you use VNT with the automatic topology building and the, the cutting down of the ARP broadcasts, you actually drop those uh, broadcast and unencapsulated packets way down at the, uh, at the hypervisor node and the VM as well. And so uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier when we were talking about how we build the topology was convergence. And convergence actually uh, is dependent upon LSP and the LSP cycle time. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you could probably drop that 30 second default in a small infrastructure down quite significantly. So those of you who are interested in deploying private clouds you know, with something like this, uh, might want to tweak the LSP cycle time, get a little bit faster convergence at the expense of a little more traffic. Uh, but notice one thing about this. Um, it stays in band, right? It's not growing as I add more R bridges. So that's a very good thing for scalability, uh, even up to 80 or 90 R bridges, which is probably about as many VMs as you can put in the data center on 80 or 90 nodes. I don't know, maybe some of you have bigger ones. <laughs> um, the other thing that, that we did, of course, was to add VNI to this solution. So 
What about VNI convergence? Well, it turns out it's also dependent upon the LSP cycle time, but there are some artifacts in the calculation, uh, timing artifacts, you know, when, when one piece of information is ready, that make it more variable. Uh, but still, it stays within two minutes, or about four times that cycle time. Um, actually, the math is a little more complicated than that, but uh, you, could, you could still affect this positively by dropping that cycle time. And again, it stays in band. As you grow the number of VMs it, it, and the number of uh, hypervisor nodes, it doesn't grow exponentially. It's very, it's very stable that way. Uh, so it's not 100% a positive story. Um, if you look at throughput, this is sort of the cost. Um, if you take a standard 10 gigabit network and you start pumping data through it with, um, without any of this stuff, you get about 6 gigabits, 60% Ethernet. Um, and if you use Trill, you get, at least in our solution, you get about a little over 4, OK? Um, and with VNT, there's a little bit of a, a per continued performance drop. We actually think that, that this, is, uh, this is a throughput drop, not a latency drop, as the green side shows. The latency is the same, but the throughput does go down. So we actually think this is due to the fact that we're running it on our nodes. Those nodes run Linux. Linux has a, uh, a known memory transaction inefficiency. Uh, in order to address this problem in the future, we're actually looking at maybe finally getting after that inefficiency and using a, a more efficient algorithm to do the encapsulation, the encapsulation that is actually adding to this overhead. But still, you're still ahead of the game, even with this hit. So one other thing that I'll mention here, um, when we deploy VNT on the nodes, uh, we actually don't need to upgrade our switches. Remember that encapsulation takes the MAC addresses of the nodes, uses them to hide all the MAC addresses of the VMs, and the layer two switch says, yeah, looks like a frame to me. Here you go. Not a problem. Even if you implement Trill, our bridges in your network, you still don't need to upgrade. Why? because we implemented the VNI using an RFC compliant critical option. So all those R bridges in that configuration, they just kind of get treated as forwarding R bridges instead of encapsulating and de-encapsulating. So in conclusion here, um, VNT really can solve the problem of uh, providing large-scale multi-tenancy with private VLANs. It solves the layer two scaling issues we hit. It, uh, it solves the VLAN exhaustion problem, which is a big problem. Uh, it is near zero configuration. I mean, when you deploy it in this way on the nodes, not in some other switch, uh, you don't have to do anything <laughs> to, that, uh, to that node for it just to work. You just have to start tagging the interfaces, and it will learn the topology. And there is no upgrade required to your existing infrastructure, no software-defined networking, no you know, new switch. So we're, um, we're very proud, actually, of the solution. We, as I said, we have it running in beta in our infrastructure now. Uh, and the best part, open source next year. <laughs> <laughs>